Today's scripture will come from Ruth 4, 13 through 17. Ruth 4, 13 through 17. I'll read. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be, be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For, you, for, you, for your daughter-in-law who, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him, laid him in her net lap and became his nurse. The neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And this is the word of God. Amen. At this time, Reverend Andrew Pack will come out and give us our sermon, and a sermon has been born to Naomi. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. I think I had too much. I'm overflowing. <laughs> All right. So today... We're still continuing in our study of the book of Ruth. The title of today's message is A Son Has Been Born to Naomi. So we have been studying the book of Ruth for a while now. And let me just briefly summarize some important lessons that we've learned so far. Um, in Deuteronomy, God said that no Moabite shall come into God's assembly, right? But then Ruth is a Moabite, and he brought her into the lineage of Jesus Christ. So why would God contradict himself like this? What we've learned is that for God, saving life is more important than keeping the law. For God, compassion and mercy are of greater priority. So through Ruth, through this mobile woman named Ruth, he was able to save this lineage of Naomi and her husband Elimelech and her son Malan. Both of the men have died, right? But through Ruth, he was able to continue this line, right? So this teaches us, for God, saving life is more important. And Jesus showed that to us, right? When he went and healed the sick on Sabbath day, and the Jews were accusing him of breaking the law. But Jesus said, saving his life is more important than keeping the Sabbath, right? Also, from the book of Ruth, we have learned that we are our brother's keepers. Cain didn't think so, right? Remember, Cain killed Abel, and when God asked him, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that is yes, right? So through the law of Goel, right, the kinsman redeemer law and leveret marriage laws, which God instituted, is teaching us that we need to help our brothers and sisters, help one another to preserve our spiritual inheritance and preserve our spiritual lineage, right? Because God's desire is not for any lineage within his covenant people to be cut off. God's desire is that not one single person in his kingdom lose his inheritance. He wants each and every one of us to receive our full spiritual inheritance, the kingdom of God, right? And he wants each and every one of our families to continue in the faith without being cut off until Christ returns. And Boaz and Ruth, and especially Boaz's faithfulness, enabled this to happen, right? Remember, so Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, had two sons, Chilion and Malan, right? All these men died. Malan was married to Ruth, right? 
So Ruth and Naomi came back to Israel, and these women had nothing. They lost everything. They left Canaan, right, because of the famine. And when they came back, they had nothing. But the law says, if your brother dies, then the closest relative is supposed to go and redeem his inheritance so that it will not go to some other family or to some other clan or to some other tribe. And also, the second part of the law says, if he dies without any male heirs, he is supposed to marry the widow and raise up a child in his name. So that's what Boaz did, right? Boaz was a close relative of Elimelech, so he married Ruth, and they had a child together. Also, he redeemed their family inheritance for them so that now Naomi and Ruth have a home, right, and land. So the two of them had a child, and the child's name was Obed, okay? So this kinsman redeemer law, or in Hebrew, it's goel, right? What this teaches us is that this is a way to preserve the path of the coming Messiah, right? Because by Boaz doing this, he was able to give birth to Obed, who was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David, right? So through Boaz's faithfulness, King David was able to be born. And not only that, much further down the line, who became a descendant of David? Jesus came as a descendant of David, right? So Boaz's faithfulness and Ruth's faith enabled the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their faithfulness opened up the way for Jesus to come into this world. And not only that, it preserved their inheritance, right? This inheritance is inheritance of land. So in other words, this is symbolic of the fact that their faithfulness oh, enabled the establishment of the kingdom of God. Because Canaan is a symbol and a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God, right? So what this teaches us is that an insignificant individual like Ruth, a Gentile woman, her life has significant influence and lasting influence, okay? So that means us, all of us here today, we're just normal individuals, right? We think, oh, our names are not going to shine in historical records or anything like that. But when God uses us and when we are faithful to God, our little work, our tiny little work that we do here at church or wherever it is that we, we do this work, that could have lasting influence, and it could do great things, and it could enable God to establish his kingdom here on earth, right? So we must take pride in this fact. Don't be arrogant, but we take pride in this fact, and so we must be faithful unto death, right? So that through our work, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, his path can be opened, right? Amen? One person says amen. Thank you, Deaconess Joanne. All right, so today's text says a son has been born to Naomi, right? Why did the, the neighbors say a son has been born to Naomi when a son has been born to Ruth? Right, it's talking about Obed. And that's what we want to talk about today. Well, it's because of the Leveret marriage law, right? The Leveret marriage law says when, a, a, when your brother dies, Ruth's husband, Malan, died, right? When he dies without a male heir, the closest relative is to marry the widow and raise up a child in his name. So in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, it says, you're supposed to do that, and the firstborn child will raise up the name of the deceased brother. Okay? The firstborn is to be given to the lineage of the deceased brother. 
So that's why the neighbor said, a son has been born to Naomi. Because Obed is the firstborn, so now he will be Naomi's grandson. Right? The word son there in Hebrew is ben. And it could mean son, it could mean grandson, it could mean descendant. Okay? So the neighbors are saying, now Naomi's lineage is not cut off. Obed will raise up her line, right? So what is all this teaching us today? Well, it is teaching us about Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Goel. Okay, Jesus is our Goel. Why? Well, because we were all dead in our sin and transgressions, right? All of us who are Adam's descendants, we were all dead. But by Jesus coming and redeeming us through his blood, he regained our inheritance for us, which is the kingdom of heaven. He made us alive again, spiritually. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 2 says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See? We were all dead. We had nothing. And then Jesus came, redeemed all that for us. So that's why he's our Goel. He's our kinsman redeemer. He bought all of that back for us. Now we have everything. Now we are alive. Now we have an inheritance waiting for us in heaven, right? So that's what Jesus did. And Boaz's and Ruth's example is a foreshadowing of the work that Jesus is going to do. In other words, Jesus enabled Abraham's lineage to continue on. He raised up Abraham's line. Because Abraham's descendants are the promised children, right? They're the ones who are to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But what happened when Jesus came into this world? The Jews had lost their faith. Right? Their religion was very formalistic. It was all about just going through the motions, right? They were basically dead spiritually. And Jesus came right at the moment when it was needed, when it, the hour was, was darkest, and he came to raise up Abraham's lineage with people like Ruth, Gentiles, right? He saved Gentiles to become Abraham's children. Right? And that's one of the biggest reasons why he came. He came at a moment when the line was about to be cut off. In order to prevent that, he came in this world to save us, right? So, one problem that we face here is this. So, Obed is supposed to go under. Let me redraw this. Obed is supposed to go under Milan's line, right? So there are two lines here. One for Boaz and one of Elimelech, right? Elimelech ma married Naomi and they had Milan. Milan married Ruth, right? But he died. these guys all died. So Ruth married Boaz and had Obed. And according to the lever of marriage, Obed is now supposed to go in this line, okay? He's supposed to be here. But if you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, in Jesus' genealogy, we see Obed 
went under Boaz's line. It says that Boaz married Ruth and had Obed. Okay. So why is that? Well, many scholars have, have debated about this. The most logical answer is this. Obed was an only son. Okay. As I said, Jesus, uh, God's desire is that not a single line in his kingdom, in his covenant people, be cut off. So Obed is supposed to go and preserve this line, right? But if he's the only son... There is no one who could preserve this line. So as the only son, he would have to go under both lines. So in Obed, these two lines are joined together. Okay? So the two lines become one in Obed. That's what's going on here. So why is this important? Because this is a picture of, of our Lord Jesus Christ once again. Because who is Jesus? He is the one and only Son of God. And what did he do? He brought two lines together into one. Okay? If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it shows how Jesus brought two lines into one. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 says this. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having to put to death the enmity." So he's, it says that he brought two groups into one, right? Which two groups is, he talk, is God talking about here? He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Okay? So originally, the Jews were God's chosen people, right? Jesus came as a Jew. He came to save the Jews. He came to Israel, right? Remember when Jesus... Uh, well, there was a woman whose daughter was sick. She was a Canaanite woman. She came to Jesus and begged her, can you come and please heal my daughter? And what did he say? He said, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Right? This is in Matthew 15. And then what did the Canaanite woman say? Uh, 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 and Jesus said, you know, I can't give this bread that's meant for the children to the dogs. He was insulting her. He was calling Gentiles dogs, right? He was doing this to test her faith. So what did the woman say? She said, well, even dogs eat from the crumbs that fall off the, the master's table, right? And Jesus looked at her and said, wow, she has great faith. And she, he healed her daughter, right? So initially, Jesus said that he came only to the children of Israel. But then what happened? Let's go to Acts chapter 13. Verses 46 through 48. Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 48. Acts chapter 13, 46 says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiated and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. See? Paul first went to the Jews and proclaimed the gospel of Christ. But they refused it. They rejected him. Right? They didn't accept the word. So what did he say? He says, okay then, since you reject eternal life, we're going to go to the Gentiles now. So from that point, Paul and Barnabas and the apostles started to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Okay? So this is all part of redemptive history. This is part of God's plan here. 
first to the Jews, but because the Jews rejected the gospel, then grace came over to the Gentiles, right? And this is explained more in detail in Romans chapter 11, okay? So Romans chapter 11, verse 11 says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Right? That's Romans 11, 11. What this is talking about is the Jews, they stumbled because of the gospel of Christ, right? But Paul is saying you don't have to worry about that. God is aware of all this. He has that in his mind already. He has made accommodation for it. So because of the, the stumbling of the Jews, salvation came to the Gentiles. And that's, he's saying that that's going to make the Jews jealous later. Right? So, and then verse 25, Romans eleven twenty-five says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, right? God has made the Israelites partially hardened in their hearts for a time being, until when? Until a full number of the Gentiles that God has foreordained comes into salvation. So when all the number, the full number of the Gentiles receive salvation, then the Jews will be jealous, spiritually speaking, and they're also going to come receive the salvation through Jesus Christ as well. So this is all part of God's redemptive history. And the story of Ruth is actually showing this to us. Elimelech and Naomi's family represents the Jews who went astray. They left Canaan because of a famine, right? So this family symbolizes the Jews who went astray. Ruth symbolizes the Gentile who benefits from this, okay? She comes in to receive salvation because of Naomi, right? And then because of Ruth and her son Obed, this line once again is grafted into Jesus' genealogy, right? So what is this teaching us? That God has everything already planned out. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And not only that, our salvation right now, we're all Gentiles here, right? Our salvation right now is all through God's grace. He went through all this. The Jews, he knew that the Jews would reject Jesus, and now the grace came over to us, and now we are able to receive this word, right? But another thing that we need to understand is this. Naomi and Ruth need each other, right? Neither one can receive salvation without the other, right? Naomi could not have done it without Ruth. Ruth could not have done it without Naomi. They are mutually needed. They need each other, right? So what is this teaching us? That in establishing the kingdom of God and in our salvation, we all need each other. Every single person is needed. We're all connected organically and spiritually. Right? We all need each other's help. Ruth needed to be evangelized by Naomi. And Naomi needed Ruth to uh, receive this uh, kinsman redemption through Boaz and through Obed. Right? As such, Jews and Gentiles need each other. In church, everybody is needed. Every single person that is here has been called by God because we all have a role to play in his redemptive work. We can't say, oh, I don't like that guy, let's leave him out. I don't like her, let's leave her out. We can't do that because God has planned it so that it's all like a big network that if one person falls out, everything fails. We all have to work together. How wonderful is that, right? So this is the principle that's at work in God's work of salvation. We must work together, we must help each other, we cannot leave out a single person. We all have to go together. Amen? Amen? Yeah. You can't leave me out. I'm here to stay. <laughs> right? 
So that's what the story of Ruth is teaching us. So God's sovereign grace was at work, and he performed all this through a couple of faithful people like Boaz and Ruth. So these little people, these these ordinary people, they did extraordinary work. And as such, today, we could do great things. So the conclusion of Ruth is what? The book of Ruth ends with the word David. That is the last word in the book of Ruth. But what about the book of Judges? Remember the book of Judges in the last verse, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, ended with the final statement saying that there was no king in Israel. And that's why everybody did what was right in their own eyes. That was the problem, right? So in other words, the book of Ruth is the solution to the book of Judges. The problem in Judges was that there was no king. In Ruth, that solution is provided. A true king named David will be born. So the book of Judges ends on sort of an anticlimactic note. There's no king. What are we going to do? Who's going to save us? Well, the book of Ruth says, well, there is this person named David. He's a, a man after God's own heart. He's going to be a true king in Israel. So in conclusion, as I said, in doing God's work at church or out in the world, we must not lose hope, we must not despair, thinking that it is in vain, because the little things that we're doing has tremendous and lasting influence in God's kingdom. Okay? God is using us in great ways, even though right now in our eyes, in the world's eyes, it may seem very insignificant. And also we have to remember that we're all connected. We have to work together. Salvation is not an individualistic thing. It's, like, it's not like, oh, I'm okay because I believe well, so God's going to save me. Well, he will, but also he wants us to work together for the whole entire community of the covenant people. So we need to cooperate with one another to establish his kingdom here on earth. So I pray that all of us will take this to heart. Remember Boaz and Ruth, their insignificant work, which seemed like little and nothing, but because of their faithfulness, Jesus Christ was able to come into this world. So everything that we do contributes to establishing the path for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we do for God's work That's going to help establish his kingdom here on earth. That's going to help bring Christ into this world. So I pray that you will all be faithful as Boaz and Ruth was so that through us, God will be glorified. Amen? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for entrusting us with your work. Thank you for using us even though we may be small and frail and weak and full of shortcomings. And yet in your hands, we can do mighty things, Lord. Father God, help us to be mindful of this. Help us to truly take this to heart. And help us to not despair, but help us to truly be faithful until death so that through us, your name will be glorified. And through us, the path for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ can be established here on earth. We thank you so much for this opportunity to glorify you through our works. May we be faithful, may we be obedient to your will, help us to be able to stand strong in our holy and godly ways so that we may not be shaken in the work that you have given to us. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.